I was a 16 year old kid coming out of Georgia, home of the Confederate flag, <laughs> and come to Washington State for Seattle for the first time because I wanted to meet my mother. She left me at birth. Uh, I think I was like six months old before I even got out of the hospital because of the uh, struggle that I had as a child. I grew up in a foster family. Wondering who my parents were the entire time, I just knew that the adoptive family that I lived in was not the one that brought me into this world. And I found her at 16, she come to Seattle. She was in Seattle. Get on a bus, scared to fly at the time, Greyhound, come all the way to Seattle, and I lived right up the street here from Seattle U on 18th and Union. Was here for a year. Enrolled in Roosevelt, even though they didn't let me go to Garfield, which is three blocks away, but still I go to Roosevelt bus in. Bus in. in one year, I was accused of being involved as a second party to a murder that I didn't commit. And several people pointed the finger at me, said they saw me help commit it, who at the time was granted immunity in exchange for their testimony. And the entire time, don't know nothing about it, didn't see it, wasn't a part of it, kept saying it over and over again. But because I was a kid that's outside of this city that no one knew, they felt it was okay to point the finger at me. I was convicted and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole and no release at 18 years old. I go into the prison system. At that point, everybody's saying the same thing. Nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wanted to talk about it. I filed appeal after appeal after appeal after appeal. Go all the way up to the Supreme Court for years, kept shooting me down. Not on the nature of the crime, but on a procedural error that said that your one year time limit has failed. Even when it's far after my 18th year to say had your trial been held today, you could not be convicted because the evidence used against you was considered invalid. However, you still failed to prove that you're gonna get a granted exception to the one year time limit. My 21st year, decided to apply for clemency. Never been done before, didn't believe it, didn't think it could happen. I knew about the Willie Horton case. I knew about all of this. No governor is going to grant an opportunity for a black man coming into prison. This was my whole mindset. I held a hearing 2006, June 5th. Unanimous board, unanimous 5-0 recommended me clemency. First time ever. Unanimous for life without the possibility of parole. Eight months later, I get a letter in the mail from the governor. I regret to inform you that we decided to go against your decision. Then all of a sudden, about three months later, I'm sitting in my jail cell, reading the newspaper, Seattle Time. It was the only way I was able to keep up with what was going on in the world. And I see the headline that reads, Faulty Evidence Dooms Murder Conviction. I look down at a picture, Conjure Glover, a kid that I've known years ago, just left me several years ago in the prison. So I said, wait a minute, let me read this case, because usually when they stack up inside the prison, the guards say get rid of it because it's a fire hazard. So some of it I read through real fast so I can get to the parts. But just, just happened to be sitting in my cell. I'm already hurt by all of this fighting and to get shot down over and over again, which I thought was the final cause. As I'm reading this case, I'm looking at the discussion of what's going on between the prosecutor and the reason why they're dropping the case it's because that the eyewitness in that case was a known liar. And the reason he was a known liar is because of he lied against a man back 23 years ago, said everything but my name. And the person that extracted that information was Collector Vest of a case that she had been working on all along that she knew this guy was a liar. That ultimately was the one that allowed us to then go back to the governor and say, can you hear me now? And on, June, on, on April 9th, 2009, I was the first man in the history of Washington State to ever walk out of the prison after being sentenced to die in there. Thank you. <laughs> but I knew after being in there for so many years, you see people coming back over and over again all the time. And you can never figure out what's going on out there that make it so exciting to come back here. Give me one shot. <laughs> and everybody had an excuse to me. And there was no excuse because you like this over that. But you hear the stories for so long, and you start going back over your mind everything that took place at trial, everything that you had a conversation with your lawyer about. At one point in the beginning of my trial, before trial even started, they was actually seeking the death penalty and gave a deadline on what date that it had to be presumed by. Came within one day of the death penalty actually being sought in my case. And I was represented by three public offenders that I fired because I did not feel that they was giving me the attention and the understanding and the time that I needed. I've only seen them. I've been dealing with this for eight months. I've only seen you twice. 
can't even communicate with you by phone because you're always busy, never seeing letters other than coming back and forth and telling me this is what the prosecutor's saying. And finally, before I even got my clearance, the first time after 22 years, first time that the actual detectives and the prosecutors came to talk to me about my side of the story. 22 years it took. And when they finally come into the prison to see me, I ask, you must have took the long road to get here. <laughs> because there's no way that you really investigated this case without even coming to talk to me first and even get my side of the story. And of course, that reopened the case. They realized they made a mistake, but they still haven't exonerated me yet, which is interesting. But I say that to say, how many of us is like that? How many people coming into our prison system is impacted by that? As I sit there and watch the thousands coming through over the years, seeing like, wow, you 19 years old, but you got 45 years. For a crime that this guy, we only got three for. You see all the kids coming in with exceptional sentence, exceptional sentence, exceptional sentence, to where the exceptions become some more even than the sentence that was imposed because of guns. Weed cases, marijuana cases. One particular gentleman that I knew, homeless man, walked into a 7-Eleven, got him a can of soup, but before paying for it, he actually put it in the microwave. The cashier knew, you was a homeless man, you ain't got no money, went around to get in front of him just to take it out. He's like, get out of the way, don't try to. He got a second degree robbery, which ultimately ended up being his third strike. Those are consequences right there. That's thousands of them. And then, of course, coming home. Walking around, learning the community, traveling, talking about my story, telling everybody about this is a reality when it comes to lawyers. Inside, they don't call you public defenders. They actually call you many, many of you public pretenders. Because that's a reality if people feel like you're being shuffled like homework through caseloads just to get to the end result of the case without actually getting to the direct verdict. And then you out here in this community talking to folks, learning about the old incidents that lead people to do the things that they do. If a person don't have a job and they got kids and every time they go apply for a job and they get shot down, when their kid or their family is hungry, you're going to go find that food. Even if that means selling a dime bag somewhere to get away with it, uh, shoplifting at a mall or store, things like that. Society introduces or cre creates the situation that people do that ultimately end up in the system. And it's unfortunately that it feels to me, and I personally believe this, the system is designed to capture them and give them that conviction. Because that conviction when it's in itself prohibits future jobs, housing opportunities, voting, which I think is the biggest one that's why it is. And even when you trace it back over by, throughout historical history in America, way back when we won our right to freedom of from slaves, the very same law that freedom of, of slaves is actually the law that gave us conviction. Because if you actually read the amendment, it says slavery in this country is hereby abolished except for those convicted of a crime. So what do you think that told slave owners to do? Convict them of a crime. This is the criminal justice system designed to perpetuate these laws and now for people to get these convictions that ultimately lead for them to be filled up in our prison system. So it's no coincidence to me that our prison system is just as equivalent as our slave system was back 400 years ago. That's no coincidence to me. But then you look at the system and the laws and you wonder, Who's at fault? How do we fix it? What can empower us as a people? Because as you've seen recently, and I'm just not saying how old folks are, but just over the last year, you've seen that there is really no difference between a racist cop's gun and a judge's gavel. Let me say that again. In my opinion, there is no difference between a racist cop's gun than a judge's gavel. Both are designed to take your life by any cause. And some people feel it's probably better by the cop, racist cop's ga ga gun than a judge's gavel because at least he or she don't have to sit there for the rest of their life for some crimes that only measure something small. Society creates the people that it actually creates. And poverty is a key factor, most important factor in my opinion, because when people are poor and you can't afford things, you're going to get exactly what you can afford. Whether it be, if you're poor, you get poor representation. That's just the way it seems. When you're poor, you can't afford nothing, you don't have anybody to believe in you. You don't have any of the tangible things to help you show that I'm this kind of a person, I'm good, trust me, uh, believe in me. And the lawyer relationship is the one thing that I think is the broken piece because had you had a chance to know me like you're almost capable of being known, then you would have understood the situation about my life. You working on me as a lawyer, you should have known that I've only been in Washington for a year. 
If you was my lawyer for over a year, you should have known why I came here, what I was situation I was in. You would have even known what school I went to. You would have known my story, my life, before you went into that courtroom to represent me. You would have known the kind of things that I do as a hobby, what I like to do, how what our values are. Not just someone that you see and think, okay, this is a person going to lie, so I'm not going to trust him off the top anyway, so anything you say to me, I'm not going to believe, but be quiet. I got you in court. Your Honor, he pleads guilty. I think about Mr. Wingate, the golf club man that I went to battle over because this is a man that got pulled over because he was actually, for those of you I'm sure you know, that actually for carrying a golf club as his cane. And we fought this long before it was in the news because we believed in this 70-year-old man who used to always be down in the community, always telling us, respect law enforcement, respect law enforcement. <laughs> Mr. Wingate, respect law enforcement. With his golf club. They took his golf club before any of you even knew about it, took him to court, put him in a paddy wagon, which is in a van that broke a lot of people's hearts, and actually got a conviction before the tape came out eight months later. Then everybody questioned this officer but they forgot about, so how did he actually get a conviction? What court system allowed this man to get a conviction when eight months later the case, the, the, the video comes out and you realize that it was a lie, but then how did he get through a court system that allowed that to take place? Of course, when the tape came out, they hurry up and got rid of the conviction, but for me, how did he get it in the first place? Did anybody even bother the fact that this is a 70-year-old man that actually was a veteran at war that fought in two wars for us? Never been in, uh, convicted or in charge at any time in before. The same man that's out there in the community telling these young kids to stop doing all of this stuff because this is how you end up in jail. And yet he get a conviction for walking down the street, walking while black. In fact, I even told the media, I said, the next time they have the U.S. open, I'm going to tell Tiger Woods you can't carry that golf club because that's how classified as a weapon in Seattle. <laughs> and that's a real threat, the language. It's not a golf club when it came to the eyes of the court. It was a weapon. Those are key languages that we lose sight of when we feel like in a community that's impacted by poverty and race. Because to me, race is the single biggest factor in all of this. In fact, it's so huge that we're afraid to even admit it when we see it. Like Charleston. We won't even admit, as a society, that was a race-motivated killing, massacre. We won't even put the hate crime on it. We won't even call it terrorists when it impacts my community. When you walk out here in the community, you travel throughout the local neighborhoods and meet all the young black kids that you see and talk, all you got to do is look around and you probably see three or four cars of police. It's almost feeling like you're in a shark tank. And the first mistake, whether you walk on the side of the road, whether you cross this crosswalk, ain't even cross the street yet, jaywalking, just for a baby to have the immediate contact with this person, just to harass them, hoping they explode so they can arrest them. This is a reality. Living under those pressures in a community of poverty, surrounded by police every day talking about why this is their neighborhood, not ours. In fact, some even claim in the central area where you sit right now today, the police is the one that's using their tools to gentrify this area because that's the only way they can get you out. Create that kind of consistent harassment over and over again to make families say, I need to move away from here, which is insistently what they're trying to do. But the what's most unfortunate for me is when you end up in these criminal justice system and the person that's supposed to represent you is not doing a job enough to convince the court to say, do you see what's going on here, Your Honor? Clearly throughout history that we have captured, from, particularly from the NAACP, some major, major victories as we've seen the gay marriage today, as we've seen yesterday, Affordable Care Act, even though this year the biggest decision and setback we have is our voting rights act. Mm -hmm. I don't want to dismiss that because that's 106 years ago. It's the foundation of the NACP, and after 100 and some years of fighting for it, we had a huge setback this year alone. But nobody wants to talk about that because that's shame, that shifts the burden. And people of color have been fighting for equal protection, equals under the law, and even equal respect to this country longer than many of us have been alive. That's a reality. And the race debate and the divide comes from people don't understand poor people are treated different than rich people. Challenging issues, particularly in this watch Seattle High School just not even three months ago, that said any, any child that transfers from one school to the next in a year, even the basketball star, you cannot participate in that sport for the remainder of the year if your whole family moves. But the people of poverty think, I might have to move because my job changed me. Or I might can't afford to live in this house anymore because pretty soon you ain't going to be able to afford to live in Seattle, so I got to move further away. And so then now this kid 
cannot participate in sports, and that's the sole reliance on scholarships, opportunities, and everything else for this family. To have to fight that because the people in Bellevue is not impacted by it, who actually is the one that introduced it. But the kids in Federal, uh, kids in Rainier Beach, Federal Ways, Tacomas, Yakimas, Pascos, uh, Vancouver's, all the little pockets is the one that's the targeted because quite frankly, they just mad that these young black kids winning the championships every year. Want to make money. That's the reality. And when it comes down to litigation, somebody decided to go file a lawsuit to claim, and the fact that the kid don't have that quality of representation, the kid loses every time. And what you need is lawyers that actually get it to fight for it in a way to understand that this impact this community because it ain't just about this person, it's everybody like this person that's impacted that don't even have the voice that others may have. So as president of the NWSB, I speak for those that don't have the voice to speak for themselves. And I want to be the ambassador coming out of prison to let folks know that all the things that you think about people inside, it's not because they're a bunch of horrible people, it's a bunch of people that didn't have a chance and an opportunity. Some of which are horrible, because I will admit there's some that I don't want to see either, but for the most part, that these are some of the most brilliant, genius-minded, and part of me actually feel to this day that they were a direct threat because of their brilliance is the reason why they're in there. And that's the reality we face in our community. Destroyed the pillars of our community, the young black man, as we've seen from Ferguson. I actually went to Baltimore and Ferguson, but I went to Baltimore this year because I really want to get on the ground out there and feel what the vibe was in the community. I knew the big cry was, there's National Guards that's coming to town because Baltimore is under direct threat. The whole reality was, it's because they showed that the gang members, the Bloods, the Crips, and the BGF, the Black and Real Family, formed an alliance to say, call the truce. That in turn become the police excuse to say, we're under direct threat, therefore we want to call in the National Guard. Not because they feared for their life, they just feared the unity of those black folks. As I went down and I talked to the Bloods, the Crips, it's on our website, you'll see that I want to hear, why is it this way in Baltimore? And I heard some of the most incredible stories from the kids in Baltimore standing in the same spot with Freddie Gray, there's 13 young African-American women that was describing to me that Freddie was like the sixth one in the last nine days. But more significantly for me is that they said everybody around here in this entire neighborhood don't even have a job in Baltimore. Baltimore is a city that actually have all the hundreds of thousands of jobs from people in the surrounding areas like DCs and all these other places. And when they get their paycheck, they takes it back out into those others economy that leaves us desolate here. Even though perceptually we look like we're led by a bunch of black leaders. And then you walked into the project, and in every gap between the project, the kids are playing kickball around huge green garbage cans with cans all over the ground. They actually threw all their books out their window in the entire project. There's thousands of books laying in their street because they're rejecting the system, institutional racism. But do you think you captured that on CNN? Do you think CNN and all these other medias are talking about the impact, the racial impact, and the poverty level of Baltimore that's so egregious, all they heard about was a curfew? And I remember specifically the night, it happened to be the same night that the big fight was happening, and they wouldn't even, and after that, Marilyn Mosby came out and made the announcement, standing there with 2,000 people, and I'm looking at the National Guard in the dark, and I'm not moving and nobody else is moving, and CNN is doing a countdown. Curfew goes into effect three minutes, two minutes, what, like setting it up. And it's clearly seen these people ain't leaving because they're there to say this stuff is wrong, we rejected all of our system, and by the time they come up with some ideas about to fix it, it might be 10 years later, and you'll probably lost 10,000 lives. But when we talk about Seattle, for those of you that is naive, that don't think that Ferguson can happen here, pay attention, because it's already starting, and it's actually happening. The Black Lives Matter movement, all these, these young kids, is real, they're mad, and I'm so proud of them, simply because they actually understand that the system is not there to help them, they're actually there to harm them, and they want to stand up to it, and the question for them is, why is it so hard to change something that's wrong? Why are we fighting a system for as long as we've been fighting it? That's clearly wrong. And when you've got thousands and thousands of people that's going up against 12 or 15 who's in power, then what is the struggle really about it? The people call for it, change it. And we're tired of the police coming into our neighborhood, into our school, arresting our kids. The disproportionality and discipline rate. Uninvestigation right now, Seattle Public Schools. Kid throws pencil, kicked out. 
even says to teachers, I don't understand what you're talking about. Go to the office. Because you don't even understand how to communicate with a young kid, particular kid of color. And rather than addressing this and correcting this matter, you expel them, kick them out of school, you actually throw them out on the street. And then you worried about why our graduation rate is so high or so low. Why so many kids is out of school. But I'm gonna tell you a true story of something that ain't never, I, something that's really probably one of my proud moments. Is about three years ago, there was a kid that went to Bothell High School that's sitting in class as a junior year. And in class, class was over with, teacher said, anybody wanna leave? It's time to go. Any other questions? White kids raised his hand. Asked a ridiculous question. Teacher responded. Any other question? Same kid raised his hand. It's a powerful story. Asked another ridiculous question. OK, any other question? Same kid. To one kid, black kid, turns around, man, stop acting. Use the word retar retarded. This white kid got upset, all of a sudden emotional. Just, oh my God, I can't believe you called me. I mean, next thing you know, they both get sent to the principal's office. The black kid gets suspended from school, which is only three weeks left in school, got suspended because he used an R word, and it so damaged this white kid. White kid stayed in school. I'll fast forward the story. It was only two weeks left in school. Meant that as a basketball player on the high school team, that he couldn't even participate throughout the week, throughout the summer. When I got involved as NWCP, come out and said, look, explain to the principal the, what the cultural terminology was because the R word in our community means you're funny. It means you're hilarious. And you don't get to penalize us because of the word we use simply because it might be affected to some. Some of the words we hear from you guys are just as offensive too. But the fact that you're gonna kick this kid out is gonna help him not be able to graduate next year, being that it's leading up to a senior year. But you got to at least give him some education while he's out. They said he can't come back, so they provided all the materials online that he needed to do to graduate to move on to the 12th grade the following year. After standing there fighting with this kid, he went on to the 12th grade. He completed school. He was actually went to the University of UCLA basketball as a star. He won the state championship here in Bothell, and he went on to UCLA, played one year. He got drafted number 11 for the NBA, and just this year, 2015, he was the actual dunk contest champion. That kid, Zach Levine. Now imagine if somebody didn't actually go there to fight for him. Imagine if somebody didn't stand up to say, time out, wait a minute. Just another kid lost in the system. And had somebody not stand there, now although he did when he got drafted, he called me that night because he did the stupidest thing again, because as soon as he got drafted number 11, the first thing he screamed out, F me. <laughs> And media went crazy on it because they was like, that means he's rejecting Minnesota. Call him. I said, man, didn't you learn anything from our world? <laughs> but it just shows that what happens when people really care about other people and think about what is right and how to know about the only reason I was invested with it because this kid happened to be closest to the kid that I raised. Had I not known that, I probably would not have defended or represented him. And then nights my kid come back and tell me about it. I was like, no, I took this kid on vacations with me. And now all of a sudden you, impact, you picked the wrong kid this time, principal. <laughs> but I think about the tens of thousands of others that I can't get to. That makes your job important. You have the most important job in criminal defense, the most important. The police is the first on the front line that create this mess. But it's you as lawyers to help tell our story in a way where court systems can get it. Because right now, I feel that judges is nothing more than DA in robes. No disrespect for any judge in the room. DA in robes is nothing but a process that's churning you out through the system, kicking you back out into the community. And of course, recidivism rates so high when they don't even give you the opportunities and the funding necessary for you to survive, but they blame it on you when you fail. That's why your job is absolutely important. And understand your clients. History, story, because everybody got a story. Understand their story would help you understand why this person is this way, and all they're looking for is somebody to care. And if you're that person that actually saving their life at that bench, then it's your duty and your job. All I can ask you is pick it up a little bit to help us out a little bit more. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it.